What is really valuable in your life? What would you say if you had to say, well, here's what's valuable in my life? Well, some of us would probably have a financial thought. We'd say, well, my house or some other thing is really valuable. Or somebody would say, well, you know, my mind doesn't go that way. When I think of what's valuable, I think of my kids, my grandkids, my husband, my wife, a relationship. That's what's most valuable to me. Others would say, well, you know what? Those are all important in my life as well, but I was just given this talent. I can sing. I can play. I love to paint, whatever it is. I've got this talent. I'm an athlete, and that is what's valuable in my life. Well, all those things are valuable. Of course, we would be grateful and thankful for any of those, but I want to ask you, have you ever considered how valuable your faith in Jesus Christ really is? What would your life be if you didn't have your faith in Jesus Christ? Think of how much more enriched and blessed your life is as a result of the fact that you have faith in Jesus Christ. It's incredible. Faith, listen, if you've got faith, you've got something money can't buy and thieves can't steal. Years ago, Tina and I had gone on a a vacation up to see the leaves turn in the east, in the eastern states. We went up to Vermont and Maine and Massachusetts and all up in there. And we, had, we were kind of stationed, you know, in Boston, and then we kind of went out from there. One day we were in Boston over uh, on, near the waterfront in the oldest neighborhood in Boston, which makes it one of the oldest neighborhoods in the United States, of course. This is where Paul Revere had lived and where the Old North Church, where the lanterns were placed during the British invasion and all of that. And so uh, we were there taking pictures, lots of arts there now, lots of, you know, history and everything there is incredible. And so Tina was taking pictures and I was looking at something and, you know, there, she was a lot further along toward the restaurant than I was. She was moving in that direction. I was over here somewhere. And I realized I needed to get caught up with it, so I started running through Christopher Columbus Waterfront Park there in Boston. And, and in the middle of the park, there's a fountain, like a round fountain about that high off the ground, you know, like a brick fountain. I wasn't paying that much attention to it because I was running to catch up with Tina because we were headed somewhere. And as I was running, I was noticing the engraving on this fountain at Christopher Columbus Park in Boston, and I as I was running by, I was just reading it out of the corner of my mind. I saw the word faith, and I, and I stopped, and I turned and ran back to look at it. And this area, not only was the area where Paul Revere grew up, but also it was the area where John Fitzgerald had grown up. He had been the mayor of Boston and was a powerful figure, even in the late 19th and early 20th century. And his daughter, Rose Kennedy, the mother of President Kennedy had grown up, obviously, in that neighborhood as well. So they had made this fountain in her honor there in the Christopher Columbus Park in Boston. And the engraving, the inscription, was, and it was a quote by Rose Kennedy. Well, it was, it was about faith, and I was so uh, touched and moved by it, I wanted to write it down. And the only thing I had to write it down on was this little New Testament that I carry around my hip pocket everywhere I go. And I had a pen, and so I just opened up my Bible and wrote down right there on that page the quote. And what it said is this, if God were to take away all his blessings and leave but one gift, I would ask for faith. I'm so impressed by that because here's a lady whose father was a powerful political figure when she was a child. She was born in wealth and privilege. Then her husband was one of the great industrialists of the early 20th century. Her son became... She had a son who was a war hero. She had another son who was president, another son who was attorney general, two sons who uh, were senators, United States senators, lots of wealth, lots of privilege, name recognition. Some people call the Kennedy family the royal family of the United States. You don't have to agree with that, but you've heard that. Here was a woman who's had pretty much anything, money and fame, prestige, wealth and privilege can afford you. And basically, she said this, if God were to take away everything of blessing in my life, I want him to leave me my faith. Of all the things most valuable in your life, faith has to rank high up on the list. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've got faith, you've got something that money can't buy and thieves can't steal. And here's one thing that I will guarantee you. 
Living by faith is never by accident. You never live by faith by accident. Nothing in the Christian life comes accidental. Growing in your prayer life is not an accident. Becoming more knowledgeable in the Word of God is not by accident. Becoming more uh, humble and service-oriented and more willing to share your faith with those around you, that is never accidental. It is always a matter of response. Faith always responds. Faith always finds a way to take action. That's what I want us to look at today as we look at the subject, faith responds. Would you open your Bibles with me, please? to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It's a 21st century translation. But if you want a readable translation, which is also very literal, this is the translation I recommend. English Standard Version. Now you'll find this on page 864 in the Bible provided there at the pew rack, or we have it on the screens. But I want you to notice what the Bible says. One of the Pharisees asked him, that is Jesus, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, you know what that means, right? It means check this out. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. You say, what kind of sinner was she? Well, just imagine the worst thing you've ever done and double it. She was so much involved in a life of sin We don't even know her name. All we know about her is she was known as a sinner. And so when she learned that he, that is Jesus, was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment and stood behind him at his feet, weeping. And she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And here we are, Luke making sure that we get it in our heads, what kind of woman this is and what she has done in her life that has earned her this strange reputation. And then I love this next verse of scripture. And I got to pause here. The Bible says here, and Jesus answering him said, now wait, pause, hold up. Notice that the Bible said about Simon, he was saying to himself all of this. In other words, he was thinking it. And Jesus answering him said, so all I want to say is this, whatever you're thinking, Jesus knows. There's no sense in trying to run and hide from it. Because look, I have a pretty good idea what you're thinking, but Jesus knows what you're thinking, all right? And so you might as well just give it up right now. He already knows. And uh, the Bible says, Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it. Verse 41, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii. Denarii is a coin. It's a, it's a mon- has monetary value. One owed him 500 denarii, the other owed him 50. So this is, you know, 10 to 1 ratio, easy to figure out. One's a big number, one's a smaller number. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he answered to him, you have judged rightly. And you almost think in the back of your mind, you've judged rightly this time, because he missed it big time in his judgment on that woman a minute ago, and, and the appropriateness of what was going on. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Now, isn't that an understatement of a question? You're at a dinner party, and Jesus is there, and a woman who is known not by her name, but by her sin, has come in uninvited, is kissing the feet of the Lord, and wiping his feet with her hair, and rubbing ointment on his feet, the fragrance of which has filled the room. And I'm going to tell you something. You may think, well, that was normal back in that day. No, 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 sir. Nothing normal about this. In fact, it's even weird now. And you know, we live in a permissive anything goes culture. 
But I'm going to tell you right now, if you invited me over to your house for lunch one Sunday afternoon and some woman off the street from the neighborhood that you already knew all about and everybody had already talked about came in uninvited, started kissing my feet and massaging ointment on my feet and I'm just eating my lunch, you'd be like, call TMZ. We got a story here. <laughs> Something up. And if you think it would be weird in our permissive society, jet back about 2,000 years ago and figure out how, how it seemed. It was weird. Everything about it was weird. And the man said, this can't be a prophet. I've heard this man was a prophet, but he can't be a prophet because if he was a prophet, he would, he would have insight into the type of woman this is. And if he were a prophet, even if he didn't know what kind of woman she was, he wouldn't let her heard do this. This is highly inappropriate. So, Jesus tells this story about the money lender and the two people that owed him the money. And then he asks this incredibly understatement question. Do you see this woman? <laughs> Praise God. Simon's thinking, that's all I do see, to be honest with you. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. It wasn't mandatory, but it would have been a nice gesture. These people walked around in sandals, on hard surface dirt, and ruts, and rocks, and dust. And, you know, they didn't have air conditioning. So if you come into a banquet and the host offers you a, a little pail with some cool water to rinse your feet, that was a nice gesture. Jesus said, you didn't do it. He said, you didn't give me the customary kiss. Now, guys, look, I want to be like Jesus, but you don't have to kiss me. I'm going to tell you right now. It's kind of a cultural thing. But if we go to shake hands and you don't want to shake my hand, it'll seem strange to me, wouldn't it, to you? Have you ever offered your hand to someone and they just don't want to shake it? Maybe that's just me. It's happened a couple times. You know? It's weird. It's, it's unnerving. Jesus said, I came to your house. I'm your guest. You didn't give me the customary kiss on the cheek, a Middle Eastern custom. You didn't do it. This woman kisses my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. Now this one, friend, I'm going to tell you something. If you come over to my house and I want to be like Jesus, I'm going to bring out like a big jug of oil, just pour it on your head and say, just be like Jesus. And you'd think, I'm not going back to the pastor's house under any circumstances. <laughs> So don't ask me why culture is what it is, but this was a custom. Put, anoint the head of the guest with oil. Jesus said, you did not do this. It's a custom. It's a cultural thing. You didn't do it. It would have been nice. It would have been the appropriate thing to do, but you didn't do it. But this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. And so he says, do you see this woman that's done all this? Her sins, verse 47, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And basically what they were saying is this, well, who does he think he is, God And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, there are two aspects about faith that are present throughout the New Testament. One aspect of faith is Jesus always blesses and rewards faith. Always. And the second aspect of faith that is always present in the New Testament is that you and I must live by faith and demonstrate our faith through how we live. The Bible says the just will live by faith. It doesn't just say we'll think about faith or that we'll carry faith somewhere as a particle inside of us somewhere. We live by faith. It is our it's expressed through what we do. Our faith will be noticeable. And these two things are always present in the New Testament. Jesus blesses faith, and you and I live by faith. Those two concepts, they're twin concepts, inseparable, are expressed in two different thoughts. D.L. Moody said, one, there is nothing on this earth 
that pleases Christ so much as faith. In other words, Jesus blesses faith. And then the other truth is that we are responsible, responsive in our faith. Alan Redpath said this, faith is two empty hands held open to receive all of the Lord. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, you never live by faith by accident. We are, we are always receiving. We're responding. We're holding out our hands. So here's the truth I want you to see. It's very simple. Jesus rewards faith that responds. Are you all with me today? Jesus rewards faith that responds. Verse 44, look at it again. I just want us to get this story, just the end of it. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It was the 19th century, early 20th century British Pastor Alexander McLaren from Manchester who said there can be no faith so feeble that Christ does not respond to it. I've seen and heard over my lifetime, I've heard this question asked to me a few times, Pastor, I don't know if my faith is big enough or I'm not sure that I have enough faith. Do I have enough faith? Ladies and gentlemen, let me drill down on this subject. It is not the size of your faith that matters. It is the size of the God you place your faith in that makes all the difference in your life. Now, I'm not saying that we should live with pygmy faith or dwarf faith, and if you've got a little bit of faith, you want it to grow. I'm just suggesting to you that the power of faith is not in the size of the faith or the strength of the faith. The power of faith is in the placement of the faith. Where is your faith placed? And even if your faith is small or new or, 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 or stymied or dwarfed, your faith can make a difference in your life, and God will always respond to faith, no matter how small or new it may be. In fact, this woman's faith is new. You say, how do you know? How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. Because everybody in her town only knew her as a sinner. They had no idea she had a relationship with Jesus until this day. Her faith was brand new. And so, You may say, well, you know, this is a pretty incredible faith this woman has. Boy, I'm telling you, Luke sets this up. Can I just share something with you? Don't you love that experience you have when you read something in the Bible that you've read, I don't know, a thousand times, and all of a sudden you see it in a way you never saw it before? Luke tells us three significant stories before he gets to the story of the woman and her faith. There's four major stories in chapter 7 of Luke. The first one starts in chapter 7, verse 1, and you remember this, it's that centurion who has a servant who's sick. All right, remember this? And he sends other servants to Jesus to say, I've got a servant who's sick, he needs to be healed, but don't bother coming to my house. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. So I'm a man under authority, I understand authority, you say the word, my servant will be healed. Now, we all know that story. I, I, I'd like to stop and preach on that, but let me just say this. The servant, the sick servant of the centurion, try that a few times, the sick servant of the centurion is the one who received the blessing of the Lord. Are you with me? This isn't a trick question. The, the sick servant is one we never meet. It's like he's behind the scenes. We never see him. We don't know how tall he is. We don't know how old he is. We don't know what color his hair is. All we know is that somewhere off the, off the scene, somewhere behind the curtain, there's a sick servant, and the centurion is the one making the request. But watch this. Look how Luke tells the story. The centurion doesn't even go to Jesus on behalf of You're going to love this when I get there. The centurion does not go to Jesus with the request. He sends other servants with the request on behalf of the sick servant. Everything about that story shows distance between the one who gets the blessing and Jesus. Jesus is here, then you got the servants, then you got the centurion, then you got the sick servant we don't even meet. There's distance. 
The next major story is Jesus is walking through town and he sees a funeral procession and there's a bunch of guys carrying a casket up to the boot hill. And Jesus resurrects the dead man right in the middle of his own funeral procession. Now you talk about distance. This dude's not across town. This dude is across the gulf between life and death. This dude has already slipped the surly bonds of earth. He is no longer with us. Let me put it this way. He's dead. (laughs) He's as far away as he can get. And yet Jesus bridged that gulf. But you see again, Luke telling the story, faith at a distance, power, blessing from a distance. Jesus in life, a man already dead. Third story, John the Baptist is in prison. This is all in chapter 7. I'm not making it up. John the Baptist is in prison. Now, just like the centurion, and this is what triggered my thinking on this, just like the centurion, he sends his disciples to Jesus because he's stuck in prison. He can't get out. He sends his servants to Jesus and asks them to ask Jesus, are you the one? And it wasn't for them, it was for him because Jesus said, go back and tell John, John the Baptist, what you've seen, because he does a bunch of miracles right in front of him, and let him know, let him know what you saw and heard, and that'll convince him. So what you have is this, distance. John the Baptist is not in the proximity with Jesus because he's stuck in prison. So he has to send servants. Are you all with me? Every one of these stories, you got a man across town, a man in prison, and a man dead. And all of them are uh, are removed from Jesus because of these distance issues. Now Luke is telling a story, and I'm telling you, there is no movie maker on earth who could tell it any better than this. I wish somebody would just make a movie out of chapter 7 because the cinematographer would get a, well, an Oscar and Academy Award because he's telling... John- Watch this. Luke is telling the story from way out here. A sick servant, Jesus is across town. A dead man, he's already off this planet, and Jesus is still here. A man in prison, and Jesus is out. So here's the camera, here's the blessing. Luke has set us up to believe God does his best work from a distance, and then all of a sudden, fast zoom to a woman crying on his feet, kissing his feet, wiping his feet with her hair, and putting ointment on his feet like it's baby magic, like there's plenty of it. And all of a sudden, we're as far away as we can get, and suddenly we're as close to Jesus as you can possibly get. Luke has surprised us. He has shocked us with the intimacy of this last story. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm the only one excited about that. (laughs) No, no. Don't humor me. Don't humor me now. I'll get you again next week. I'll come up with something. Come on. Yeah, God will help you from a distance, but I'm going to tell you something. The sum total, the big stuff, the, the, the high water mark of faith is not what God does from a distance. It's the fact that you can get close to him. You can be as intimate in fellowship with Jesus as possible. That's what Luke wants you to see. You say, well, that sounds pretty good. That's kind of the faith I'm looking for. What kind, how do I know I have it? Well, there's a couple things about this woman's faith I want you to notice. I'm going to hurry. So if you'll listen fast, I'll talk fast. It's a selfless faith. This kind of faith that receives this blessing, this responsive faith, it's a selfless faith. You see what I mean? We look at verse 37. Verse 37 tells us her story. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, uh, alabaster, which is like a soft stone. Thousands of these jars have been unearthed by archaeologists. They're common as plastic Coke bottles. Alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, wipe them with her hair, uh, kissed his feet, and anointed him with, anointed his feet with ointment. Now, what do I mean by selfless? Selfless. Let me describe the scene real quick. He's reclining at table. What does that mean? He has his elbows on the table. He's being impolite. No. At a formal banquet, they reclined at table. The table's about that high off the ground. They didn't sit in chairs. 
They recline. Now, assuming Jesus is right-handed, you say, wait a minute, how do you know Jesus is right-handed? I don't, but 95% chance he was, because most people are. So assuming he's right-handed, he's leaning on his left elbow, and he's eating food off a table that's just about, you know, eye level. That's how they did it. Don't ask me why. It's a cultural thing. I don't like doing it, but that's how they did it. That means that he is extended all the way out. He's laying on the ground, and he's extended all the way out, almost like he's in bed, and his feet are exposed over here. And so it's easy to get to his feet. And this woman of the city, who everybody knows as this sinner, uh, you know, headline sins, she knows that Jesus is in the house and without, it's selfless. She didn't have an invitation. You think she went to parties like this? Listen, her invitation got lost in the mail a long time ago. And she didn't care about that. She didn't think a thing about it. She went anyway. Why? Because Jesus was in the house. And she went in and she started doing the unthinkable. First of all, she got overwhelmed emotionally. She started weeping and crying and, and, and uncontrollable. And I don't mean just like little bitty stuff. I'm talking about she wet his feet. She's crying so hard just to be in the presence of her Lord. She just begins to get so emotional. She's weeping and crying. His feet are wet and she's thinking, what have I done? And then she thinks, well, let me dry them off. And she's got nothing better than her long hair. She lets her hair down. She begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And then she begins to think, oh, how precious. And mm, she's starting to kiss his feet. Feet. <laughs> Y'all, come on now feet. Praise God for shoes. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you something. A person with good feet paid money for them. You, you're not telling me there's not places all over town that can fix those feet because feet, praise God, it's unnatural to have good feet. Especially when you walk around on stone and dirt, and <laughs> all that. Even Jesus' feet looked weird. They're feet. You know, when's the last time you saw a guy in love and say, man, you in love? Yeah, man. What do you love about her? Oh, man, her feet. Whoo, Lord. I love that girl's feet. Next time you see a young lady, look, I'm, on, I'm engaged. Well, what convinced you? All these choices you have. Oh, did you see the dude's feet? What feet this guy has? Well, there's a reason we cover these things up. Pay good money to have them fixed. And she's just so enamored, just, just kissing his feet. And then she's got that ointment. You know what everybody in the room thought about her? They were thinking how inappropriate. Simon was thinking, this, this is uncomfortable. This, this is not a prophet because no prophet would allow this. This kind of woman doing this? Guess how much this lady cared what the Pharisee thought? Zip. Her faith was completely, uh, absolutely abandoned to the presence. Are you all with me? Yeah. The only thing in the room that mattered to her was not how she acted and not what other people thought about her. She just was in the presence of Jesus. And her faith said, when I'm in the presence of Jesus, if I want to act a certain way, it doesn't even cross my mind what you think about me. Listen, for a woman, just the very fact that she let down her hair. Do you know, now this is not our culture, praise God, but in that culture, Jewish culture 2,000 years ago, if a woman let down her hair in public, it was grounds for divorce in Jewish culture. You, you, you can't even imagine what would be, the, what would be the, the equivalent, inappropriate public gesture for a lady in our time. And just in a response of a moment, just because Jesus was there, she let down her hair and was drying and kissing his feet. Intimate, personal, strange. And then she had this ointment, an extravagant. She, she wasn't thinking about her cost because... That ointment, Matthew refers to it as a very precious ointment. The word ointment here is the Greek word muron. We get a word myrrh. 
Myrrh is a gum. It's a resin that grows in a thorny tree in North Africa. It's hard to get to. In order to harvest myrrh, you've got to hit the tree. You've got to wound the tree. And as you hit the tree with an axe or blunt object, the resin comes out. You harvest the resin, but the tree is thorny. It's hard to get to. It's in North Africa. It's not native to Israel. This is tough to get to. It's expensive. This is a costly gesture, but guess what? In the presence of Jesus, her faith said, what difference does it make to me? I'm in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm in the presence of one who loves me and has forgiven me. What cost is too great for me to say, I love you, Lord, and everything else in life is a distant second compared to you? That's selfless faith. I don't care what people think about me. It doesn't matter what the opinions are of others about me. And you know, how many of you know, you know, maybe you're like me. When I was 20 years old, I care what people think about me. When I was 40 years old, I said, I don't care what people think about me. I'm almost 60 now. I realize they weren't thinking about me to start with. <laughs> and, and you and I, what is with us? We are so self-conscious. We live our whole life so self-conscious. I was out walking the dog the other day. This is life to me. This is how the real world operates. And I just want to say, what is the deal? I'm out walking the dog, and I'm reading my phone. I am not paying attention to anything at all. And I'm walking through the neighborhood, and there's a school in the neighborhood, right? And I'm walking by, walking, walking by the school, and the school's Wi-Fi is on. So I pick up a signal. I'm all right, cool. So I'm walking the dog, and there's a car sitting by the curb. I don't care. Just a car sitting by a curb. You know, I live in a city full of cars, so I don't really notice one more, right? Stay with me. And there's a lady behind the wheel of the car. I'm reading my phone. I got a signal. I'm walking my dog. I'm headed home. It's like 100 degrees. I'm ready to go to the house. And all of a sudden, this lady rolls down the window and said, pardon me. And I said, yeah. And she said, I'm sitting here because they have Wi-Fi and I'm thinking, this is incredible. This is life. Here's somebody who thinks they have to roll the window down and explain to me why they're sitting in front of this school. I don't care. <laughs> what do I care? Not my house. It's not my school. I didn't even hardly notice you were there. You said, well, you're not a good pastor. No, that's not the idea. You're missing the big point. Why do we live our lives thinking about what other people think about us when they're not thinking about us? We live our whole life thinking about, well, I better do what's right because there's a record of this. There's no record. I don't know if you've checked, but you can get away with anything in America. I'm not advocating it. I'm just telling you, isn't it obvious? Nobody's keeping score but God. And we're trying to please a bunch of people who don't pay attention to their own business, let alone yours. And in the presence of Jesus Christ, why are we so restrictive? And then on the other hand, what's with this Pharisee? How wrong can a man be? You know what occurs to me? You and I are so wrong so often. Isn't it amazing how wrong we can be? And even when we're confronted with what's right, we can't accept it. Leo Tolstoy, and I'm paraphrasing, Leo Tolstoy said, the most intelligent man in the world can't be convinced of the simplest idea when he already knows what he thinks. The most intelligent man in the world can't be convinced of a new idea when he already knows what he thinks. In fact, I wonder... I wonder if you're living your life today. You may be 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. And you're living your life today because something your mom said to you in the 1940s or 50s or 60s. Or something some school teacher said. Or something your ex-wife said. Or something some coach said. And all these people could be good people, but you have based your whole life. You've determined what your life can be based on somebody's uh, assessment of you. Or perhaps you yourself concluded something. Get in here close. You yourself concluded something about you a long time ago, and because of that, you have a natural ceiling, a lid you keep hitting in life because you have concluded this is what my life is, and this is as far as I can go, and this is all I'm ever going to be, and this is why I'm stuck in the 
trap I'm in, and this is why I'm not invited to the party, and this is why I can't get close to Jesus, and this is why I can't have nice things, is because what somebody said, and I believed it. Can I help you understand something? The empty tomb of Jesus changes everything about you and your future. You don't have to believe all that stuff. And this woman was young in her faith, and she'd already concluded, I don't care what they think about me. Jesus is in the house. I'm going to give him praise. It was selfless, but I want you to see something else. It was saving faith. Because Simon is sitting there thinking to himself, oh, man, this is a mess. What an embarrassment. How am I going to explain this? I got a woman off the street kissing his feet, wiping his feet with ointment. Her hair is down. What am I going to do? Good thing there weren't selfies in those days or they'd be blasting that on Facebook and he'd have been out of business. Hmm? And Jesus said, hey, I want to tell you a story. Banker. One guy owes him, and I'm doing some math equivalency. I think I'm pretty close. One guy owes him 85000 The other guy owes him 6700 It's a pretty good amount of money, but one's obviously a lot bigger than the other. So one guy owes the banker 85000 The other guy owes him 6700 and one day the banker decides to forgive them both their debt. Now, which one loved the most? And the Pharisee's a pretty good businessman, and he said, the one who was forgiven the most would love the most. And he said, right you are, but you didn't do anything of a courtesy when I came in. You didn't give me water for my feet, oil for my head. You didn't kiss my cheek, shake my hand, nothing. But this woman, she's cried on my feet, she's wiped my feet with her hair, she's kissed my feet, and she's anointed me with this precious ointment. And because she has loved much, her sins are forgiven. And then he looks to the woman and says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you got everything you want right there in those verses. Forgiveness, salvation, peace, it's all there. All the blessed. You see, God rewards faithfulness. When you act in faith, the Lord rewards it. And the most incredible reward to faith is this. You are saved. You, you, you've it, a, a, a faith like this brings you into a relationship with God which will begin now and never end. I don't know if you noticed this story in February in the Washington Post. Uh, an atheist author by the name of Elizabeth King wrote an article entitled, I'm an atheist, but I can't shake God. I thought, well, that, i got to read this. I'm an, I'm an atheist, but I can't shake God. She tells how she was raised in a Christian home, but as about a 16-year-old, she began to question everything she'd ever heard, and began to identify herself as an atheist. Now she's lived all these years into her adulthood as, an, uh, as an, a pronounced atheist, and one who's not ashamed to admit it, one who's willing to talk about it. And yet she's writing an article in the Washington Post saying, as hard as I want to forget about God, I keep thinking about Him. Now that is one backslidden atheist right there. <laughs> I mean, when you can't even doubt your doubts, that's almost faith, you know what I'm saying? And she said, I cannot shake God. I want to. I want this character out of my mind, but he finds a way to sneak back in. I mean, lady, he's not real according to you, so who are you talking about? And if you're an atheist, listen, you're, you're, uh, you're very welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I love you, and I'm glad you're here. In fact, I, I wish we had a thousand atheists here every Sunday, to be honest with you. So if you are not a believer, let's get to know each other. I'm thrilled you're here, so I'm not being critical. 16% of the American population and growing is atheist. I get that. I, 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 I'm looking forward to knowing more of them in the future. But this lady says, I can't shake God. Here was her conclusion of her article, and I'm quoting. She said, it's hard to believe in nothing when your psyche is wired for faith. It's hard to believe in nothing when your psyche is wired for faith. And I thought to myself, how, 
How sad. Here's a person who's miserable in life because she goes through life trying to get God to leave her alone so she can go around and say she doesn't believe in him. The problem is he's everywhere she turns. I don't believe in you. I know you're there. I'm talking to you now, but I don't believe in you. I don't believe you exist, even though I can't deny you. And so as a result, she's miserable. I thought to myself, you know what? Here's your choices. Either live your life miserable, trying to deny the obvious, or just say, you know what? I surrender. I believe you. I embrace you. I trust you. I take you and receive all of the blessing of God. Now, which one would you choose? I want everyone to stand for just a moment. If you would, just stand to your feet. I'm going to ask no one to leave. It's early, so just stay with us a minute. And I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads, and I'm going to ask every single person in this room, every single person to pray this prayer. You may be an atheist. You may be an unbeliever. You may describe yourself as an agnostic. You may be from another religion or have no religion at all. Well, we're glad you're here. Number one, you are among friends. We love you. We care about you, and we're glad you're here. Or you may be a person who's sold out, totally devoted to Jesus Christ. Or you may be somewhere on the spectrum in the middle and say, you know what, there was a time when I really believed, but I've been through a bunch of stuff and I'm not sure what I believe anymore. I'm going to ask everybody to pray this prayer right now. Pray this prayer. You ready? Lord, increase my faith. Everybody pray that prayer. You can just pray it silently. Lord, increase my faith. You say, I don't even believe in God. Then what can it hurt you? Just pray the prayer. Lord, increase my faith. If you're the most strongest believer in the room, just pray, Lord, increase my faith. Or maybe today you'd say, well, you know what? I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I want to live by faith. I would love to be a follower of Jesus, but I don't understand everything there is to know about the Bible. I haven't been around church that much. I don't understand all the rules and all the traditions. Well, let's clear away all that and get right down to what this is all about. This woman made it simple for us to all understand this. It's not about what other people say. It's not what other people think. Here's all that matters. You and Jesus. That's what ultimately matters, that you have a relationship with him, that you come to the point in your life when you have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And it isn't the size of your faith. It's the size of your God you put your faith in that matters. So here's the prayer I'm asking you to pray right now. Dear God, I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please come into my life, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. God, I've sinned. I'm sorry. Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my Savior. 